I'm not asking. Okay, that, that's okay. That's, that's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so our speaker today is, is Dr. Rochelle Rollins. Um, she is a Toledo uh, native living here for 33 years. Uh, she has, uh, she's married and has four daughters and one grandson. She's originally from Brooklyn, New York and has re resided in the Toledo area for 35 years. She's a, a pharmacist with a, a PhD in, in a doctorate of pharmacy. Um, and uh, she is a dedicated healthcare professional in the healthcare industry. She is also um, a member of Delta Sigma Theta and is currently the uh, president, I believe, of the alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta. Um, a lot of work goes on to that, <laughs> goes into that. Um, she um, is interested in continuing learning, I think lifelong education, and, uh, uh, and she joins us. Uh, let me see, read some of her other uh, issues here. Uh, she has a desire to empower women, which also includes being a member of Zonta International. She served seven years as a council member appointed by past Governor Kasich of Ohio to the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council and has been reappointed to Toledo Lucas County Commission on Disabilities. She launched a nonprofit foundation, Rally's Purple Bag, and the mission is helping others who cannot help themselves. She has been quoted, I may not know how to help all people with disability needs, but I can at least direct an individual or people in a direction for services and help. Um, so I would like to introduce Rochelle Rollins and somehow, oh yeah, I'm used to uh, a touch screen. Here, I'm gonna slide over and Rochelle will slide in. Well, thank you. Let me get this. There we go. Got it. Okay. I'm gonna take my mask off so you guys can hear me clearly in the room and on Zoom, in the room and on Zoom. Hey, that kind of rhymes. <laughs> All right, so I was attempted to um, try to share my screen. Um, however, the program that I have my slides on, um, we would have had to add a program to this computer and we don't wanna prolong, prolong any further. So um, the slides will be available for the League of Women Voters. Um, and if anyone wants the slides, you're more than welcome because it's all public information that I'm gonna talk about because I could not have attained this because a lot of this is from the 1800s. <laughs> okay, so, and she already told us where we are, who I am and what we're doing. And I, done my research, um, when Ms. Gurney asked me, no, not Ms. Gurney, it was another member of the League of Women Voters daughter who kind of channeled this to me a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And I thought I knew something about the women's suffrage movement, but it is so much more information. I, and when they talked about the black women during the suffrage move, uh, movement, it was even more, because I actually learned that there was other minorities as well that was in the forefront. So this is really a nice. Um, there's a lot of women that are black who um, was involved starting in the 1700s but I'm just gonna try to get to six women because it's just too many, it's a lot. Okay, so let me go to my next slide and just bear with me. So when Congress ratified the 19th Amendment on August 18, 1920, giving American women the right to vote, it reflected the culmination of generations worth of work by resolute suffragettes of all races and backgrounds. Historically, 
attention has focused on the efforts of white movement leaders like Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But they work alongside many lesser known suffragists, such as Mary Louise um, Boutinou Baldwin, um, Dr. Mabel Ping Hu Lee, and Nina Oterio Warren, who made crucial contributions to the causes which also battling racism and discrimination. So yes, the, the movement was for voters' rights, but all the women, all nationalities was also fighting for racism and discrimination for all women. So for their part, black suffragists came to the suffrage movement from a different perspective. And that was stated by Ernestine Jenkins who teaches black history and culture at the University of Memphis. Their movement, she said, grew out of the broader struggle for basic human and civil rights during the oppressive Jim Crow era. But while many 19th century women rights advocates got their political start in the anti-slavery movement, not all were keen on seeing black men leapfrog women for voting rights with the 15th amendment. Viewing the issues competitively, some leading white suffragettes aggressively sidelined Black women and their broader civic, civil rights issues like segregation and racial violence. From the moment one strategy, from, from the movement, one strategy using their platform to, per, to perpetuate stereotypes that women of color were uneducated or promiscuous. So we had some people thought differently of minorities, which happens all the time. And this right here, everyone knows Sojourner Truth, and she's um, considered the first black female in reference to being a, a, a suffragette. A lot of people know her of, of the, um, you know, underground railroad and everything. But, but through my research, I learned um, she is the first, um, person they consider a black woman of uh, uh, being a suffragette. So she was born Isabel Baum Free, which I learned that I'm so used to hearing Sojourner Truth, a slave in upstate New York. She was the first known African American suffragist and an illiterate um, preacher and a reformer from Ulster County, New York. She was an emancipated slave who suppo supported herself in men menial jobs. She traveled throughout the Eastern United States and attended women's rights conventions and, and as an outspoken prominent for women's rights and women's suffrage. And her um, overwhelming presence, personal magnetism and unique oratorial style captivated audience and one even, and one even skeptic to the cause. She also earned money by selling the narratives of Sojourner Truth, written by her by Olive Gilbert. So she may have been illiterate, but she was very resourceful to try to get her message out. So she utilized other people who can write for her and who can actually document for her. So she's really considered like the first female black suffragette. And we all know of her, um, in 1864, she traveled to Washington, D.C., where she was received by President Lincoln in the White House. In December of that, of that year, the National Freedoms Relief Association appointed her counsel, counselor to the Five People of Freedom's Village, Arlington Heights, Virginia. Truth also attended meetings of the American Equal Rights Association, where she called for the vote for other Black men for women. In the mid-1850s, she moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, where she lived among an enclave for free Blacks. In 1875, Truth returned to Battle Creek, amid forays of lecturing, where she died in 1883. So um, I almost overlooked her because I was like, okay, I know her story in a different venue. So I thought that was really good to try to highlight her in a different way, since we're educating the community about you know, women in the Blacks and the suffrage uh, movement. Okay, the next person 
Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She lived 1825 to 1911. Now she was born in, born in 1825 in Baltimore to free black parents. Harper received a, a rigorous education at the Watkins Academy of Negro Youth founded by her uncle, Reverend William Watkins and abolish an abolitionist and educator. As a teenager, she began sending her poems, which explored abolition. So as a teenager, so our young people have been involved with activism even back in the 1800s. And even today, they're very involved today with what's going on in the world. Um, and she published her first poetry collection, Autumn Leaves, around 1845. Decades later, her novel, um, Iola Leroy, one of the first to be published by a black woman in the US, told the story of mixed race women raised as white, then sold into slavery, addressing themes of race, gender, and class. Harper moved north in 1850 to teach Durham, which time she lived in a home that served as an underground railroad station. So they were really involved. Yes, these suffragettes, they were really involved with the world and what's going on. Hearing the stories of escaped slaves, um, her activism along with the passage of an 1854 law that forced free blacks who entered her home state of Maryland from the North into slavery. Unable to return home, she channeled her thoughts into activist writing and speaking. So she wasn't able to go back home after you know, her, her choices of life. When it came to the cause of women's suffrage, Harper was convinced it would not be achieved unless black and white women worked together. But while Harper initially worked with leaders like Stanton and Anthony, she was also one of the first women to call them out in terms of their racism. Notes um, Jenkins, who is given, who gave us this information. Harper's most famous confrontation came when she spoke at the 1866 National Women's Right Convention. How about that? And she, this is her quote. Um, you white women speak here of rights, Harper told the crowd, calling them out for their lack of female solidarity across racial divides. And she speaks of wrong. So she kind of like was another, you know, sometimes we have to um, let people know when we want to work together. And she was very, um, she communicated very well that she wanted to work with everyone in order for all of us to have our rights to vote to women. So that was kind of interesting to, um, and as I'm reading this, I was just imagining the, the, the dialogue, the conversations. So it's kind of neat to, 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 um, to, to, to learn of all these dynamic women. Now, the third person, Marianne Shad, Carrie, she was born 1823 to 1893. Marianne Shad Carrie, whose parents used her childhood home as a refuge for fugitive slaves, became the first black women in North America to publish a newspaper, the Provincial Freeman, in which she fearlessly advocated for abolition. After helping recruit black soldiers for the Civil War and founded a school for the children of free slaves, she taught school by day while attending law school at night. Okay, becoming one of the first black female law graduates in the United States in 1883. When the suffrage movement gained stream in the, eight, in the 1870s after the 15th Amendment granted the vote to black men, she became an outspoken activist for women's rights, including the right to cast a ballot. Isn't it something how, it seems like the circles are going backwards. Like, it's like we're talking about the 1800s, but it seemed like it's so prevalent today. So it's kind of weird what we're going through. Carrie's legal and publishing background served her well in the fight for enfranchisement in 1874. She was one of the several suffragettes who testified before the House Judiciary, Judiciary Committee about the importance of the right to vote. In her remarks, Carrie stressed the unjustness of denying women who were both taxpayers and American citizens. 
access to the ballot box. The crown and glory of American citizenship is that it may be shared equally by people of every nationality, complexion, and sex, she told the committee. So, I mean, we are still fighting for a lot of rights even today. And this is, she lived 1823 to 1893. Okay. The fourth person, her name, um, Mary Church Terrell, she lived 1863 to 1954. Um, pushed out of the mainstream suffrage movement by white leaders. Black suffragists through the 1800s found their own clubs in cities across the US, along with church-based organization. The club movement across the US along with church-based organizations was the foundation so much activism by Black women in their communities. Um, with the creation of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, Suffragist Mary Church Terrell and co-founder Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin became instrumental in consolidating Black suffrage groups across the country. Their agenda went beyond women enfranchisement, addressing issues of job training, equal pay, educational opportunity, and child care for African Americans. Terrell, an educator, writer, and organizer, also focused her work on fighting lynching, Jim Crow segregation, and, and convict leasing, a system of forced penal labor, the daughter of formerly enslaved people who became successful business owners in Memphis, Tennessee. Terrell was one of the first Black women to obtain a college degree, earning both a bachelor's and master's degree from Oberlin College, that's Ohio. <laughs> she also became the first Black woman appointed to the Washington, D.C. Board of Education and led a successful campaign to desegregate the city's hotels and restaurants. In 1898, addressed to the National American Women's Suffrage Association, she sum summarized her life's work, seeking no favors because of our color, no patronage because of our needs, we knock at the bar of justice, asking an equal chance. So that, that's uh, Mary Church Terrell. Okay, the fifth person, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs. She was born 1879 to 1961. In more than 200 speeches, she gave across the country, educator, feminist, and a suffragist, Nanny Helen Burroughs stressed the importance of women's self-reliance and economic freedom. A member of National Association of Colored Women, the National Association of Wage Earners and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. She saw voting as a crucial tool of empowerment and extension of her lifetime commitment to educating African-American women. One of her last achievements was to launch and run the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, D.C. Burroughs also spoke of the need to address the lynchings of Black Americans through the country. The most important question that Black activists were concerned with from 1916 to 1920, the years before the 19th Amendment, were lynching and white mob violence against Black people, that activists like Burroughs, Terrell, Wells saw the right to vote as a tool to create laws and protection for African-American throughout the country. And the last person, but not least, and there's a ton of other women, a ton of other women, but we only have a short time. The last person I'm gonna highlight or spotlight is Ida B. Wells. She was born 1862 to 1931. In addition to being one of the most prominent anti-lynching activists and respected journalists of the early 20th century, she owned two newspapers. Ida B. Wells was also strident supporter of women's voters' rights. In 1913, Wells, one of the founders of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, co-founded the Alpha Suffrage Club, Chicago's first African-American suffrage organization. 
The club was notable for its focus on educating Black women about civics and its advocacy for election of Black political officials. But Wells and her peers often faced racism from the larger suffrage movement when she and other Black suffragettes um, tried to join a national suffrage march in Washington, D.C. in 1913, move, movement leader Alice Paul instructed them to walk at the back end of the crowd. Wells refused. <laughs> Either I go with you or not at all, she told organizers. I am not taking this stand because I personally wish for recognition. I'm doing it for the future benefit of my whole race. So um, Ida B. Wells also the women that they said to go to the back, that's the organization that um, we're a part of. So we're 109 years old. And that was the year that our sorority was established, January 13, 1913. So, so our organization um, was the one that said, we're going to march in this march because we knew it was the right thing to do for the betterment of all people. And um, a lot of us, uh, a lot of our founders and the members of the organization at the time, they did march in the back. But Ida B. Wells, she was like, she just said, I'm just going, I do either, I'm either in or out, basically. And she made her way without the rest of the organization and she marched with the Chicago. And it was, I, I, the story is, it's a little more intense, but she's known for that. And this was our sorority first public act of, of um, social action. So we was established that January and my, by March 3rd, we took a stand and said, we're gonna do this and we did it. And I'm, yes. Yeah. So um, we're proud to say that we were there. We actually enact, um, when we turned hundred years old, we did a reenactment of the March in DC. It was really good. A lot of other organizations out there and we were there. So um, we're proud to be, even though we was at the end of the line, we was proud to be there because it was all for the right purpose. And those are the ladies that I spotlighted. Um, through my research, I learned that there were Native Americans that were safe suffragettes. I learned that there were women from Mexico, Latinas are suffragettes. Um, I learned um, that there were Asian women that was in our country that were suffragettes. So it is definitely uh, way more than what we all know, but it's always good to know our history. And I'm just glad that um, you guys gave me the opportunity to highlight the ladies. Um, I wish I could have done all of them, but it's a ton of women. I didn't realize how large this area of women were. Did you guys get a chance to hear that? Can you hear her statement? Oh, wait. Did you, were you guys, I'm going to repeat what, I, I'll repeat, uh, I'll do it as a synonym. Um, one of the members, right, what's her name? Phyllis, one of the, one of the women, um, Phyllis of the League of Women Voters, she acknowledged the fact that even today with the black women who are trying to get on the court, the federal court judges, we still have to fight over a hundred years later and maybe the suffragettes should rise up again. <laughs> the suffragettes need to rise up again and um, we continue to fight this battle. Um, we, it is a battle that we're gonna be fighting as women. I think black women, we get targeted a little harder, but just as a female in general, in reference to voters' rights, um, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, we know, they know women have a lot of power. And when we come together as all women, we make a difference. And, and I think it was known and shown on the last election, we now have a, a, a vice president, national, national vice president, 
of the um, United States. So, and a lot of women organizations came together. It did not matter if you were Latino, Native American, African American, white, we all came together to make a difference. And I believe um, a lot of people fear that. And League of Women Voters, you know, nonpartisan, just like our sororities, we, we, we fight for rights. <laughs> we don't fight for politics, but we fight for rights. <laughs> so any other questions? I, I have one one question that uh, is kind of pertains to the League of Women Voters. Uh, you mentioned people working together. And as the League, we're very interested in getting people registered to vote. And you and I chatted at one point about uh, making, uh, doing some voter registration um, processes in some high schools and 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 that you with your delta sigma theta uh sisters would have some contacts in uh in some of the local high schools and maybe the league would be happy to work with you uh in doing that okay i'm gonna repeat um league lady gurney question so that you guys can hear it she um she uh, mentioned how the league and our local chapter here um, talked about working together for um, voter registration and um, how we may have contacts with the different schools and they will work with our chapter to help with voter registration. Now, I'm gonna tell you, one of my social action chair is actually on, on the call. Dr. Oh. Regina Vincent Williams, okay. she's actually our, um, she's not in view, but she works with our, our state nationally on um, a lot of our programs. And yes, yeah, she's the one who I gave the information to when we did the registration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in September, I think it was. I think it was September. It was about September yeah. we sat there and actually our picture went someplace <laughs> I think on you guys' website. Yeah. And yes, we're willing to collaborate with, um, any organization, especially the league, because this is one of your focus. And that we only can work together to make, make it a positive situation. Yes. You guys have yes. some, some tools that we need. We yes. may know some tools that you need. And when we work together for voter registration, especially, you know, we get ready to come up in the midterms. Yeah. Um, we just want everyone to vote. It's not so much to tell people how to vote. It's just a matter of voting and mobilizing people to get to the poll. Yes, exactly. So, and, and with our primary coming up uh, now in the next month or so is our is a great time to do that. Yes. Um, yes. I, and I and like I said, Dr. Regina Vincent Williams, she is on the call. Okay. So um, she'll probably be the one to contact you or have one of our one of her committee members. Right. To make sure we make that happen, especially since the primaries are coming up. Okay, thank you. We would really appreciate that. Lynn, Lynn Marshall here is uh, on oh, uh, voter, yes. voter services, and Barb Colvin is also on the call. Oh, and wonderful. There are uh, voter services um, uh, is their main focus. So, um, trying to see. Rochelle, yes. we would like to thank you very much for your fine you presentation and how- Did you wanna come over here? I, I think I think they can see me from here, right? Can you guys hear and see? Can you see me? Lee women? Okay, good. Can you guys hear her? Yes, they yes. did the okay. thumbs up. Okay, okay, awesome. I'm gonna turn this volume down so we don't have feedback. Okay, okay. So Rochelle, we wanna thank you very much for your excellent presentation today. We all learned a, a lot, uh, <laughs> we learned a lot. Uh, and we have for you uh, uh, a, a constitution uh, and um, a copy of the constitution. And we'll, we're presenting this to you today. So um, uh, in closing, I would like to say that um, we, uh, this concludes our program. Be sure to join us next month. The information is on the league web website, lwvtoledo.org is our League of Women Voters website for Toledo-Lucas County.
Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Ms. Gurney, yes. I do, is it okay? I know we have a couple of minutes. Do yes. we wanna ask yeah. the people yes. on the Zoom if they had yes. any questions or any statements? Questions? I do see some info in the chat. I don't know if anyone is, let's see what's in there. Um, looks like- People want copies of the slides. Okay. That looks like someone, I think it's Barbara Colvin. She's left her email. So we probably have to, um, Barb, Barb Colvin, you guys know her? Yes. Okay, so she wants a copy of the slides. Um, she said, thank you. Um, I'm, if any, and it looks like one of my sorority members answered a question for me. They asked who I was. <laughs> thank you, Frankie, thank you. Um, and then also our social action chair of Toledo alumni chapter, um, she said we work with Jen Miller and others okay. from the league. And she's a member of the and she's a member of the Seneca County League of Women Voters. Oh, I didn't and realize. And they also work together with redistricting. Can I say something? Oh, oh yes, Barbara Colvin. Oh, there yes. she is. Okay, let me so, let me raise the volume up so we don't have feedback. Okay. He, somebody asked how to get the slides if they're not members of the league, and I volunteered. If they email me, I will make sure they get them. So Perfect. the slides are going to be available to the league, um, but for people who are not members of the league of the, of our league, um, and you want the slides, if you email me, I'll make sure that you get them. Perfect. Versus I don't. I want. I want the slides too, but um, I would be glad to send them out to people who are not members of the league and wouldn't have any other way of getting them. So if, okay. if they email, just e instead of having people put their emails in the chat and I have to write them down, if I make a mistake, then, you know, it doesn't work. You email me and I will get you the slides. Um, the presentation. This was very good. Thank you very much. No um, problem. Her email is in the chat. I think I read it somewhere. It's B Colvin, B-C-O-L-V as in victory, I-N at Bex.net. Okay. So if anyone didn't get that, I'm sure there's another way to make sure you get it too. They have a nice website. <laughs> Toledo. Well, I, I do have one other question. I okay. heard that Ida B. Wells then went to England in the end after a lot of the things she did here. Did you have any information about that? Um, I don't, but let's see if I can get something real quick since we still have a moment. No, no, no that's okay. I, I saw something. I I know that name and I saw that basically she had to leave. I don't know what was going on. She was very instrumental um, in, as a suffragette, but it seems like I remembered hearing that she had, either she and her son had to leave and they went to England. Um, and I don't remember what that was about, but if you don't have it, that's okay. I can look that up. Let's see if we can get it. Let's see if I can get a quick. Okay. so. It says Wells traveled to Britain in 1893 and 1894 at the invitation of social activist Catherine Empey, I M P E Y. Her second tour was far more successful than the first, as she explored as many connections to Victorian print culture as she could to maximize her message. So she did go over to England to maximize her message about. Um, women rights because that's that kind was, of interesting it's kind of interesting because i think some of us suffragettes for the white people hate to differentiate like that came they went to england and learned what the activists were doing there and then came here and now um she's going back to britain to uh join with some activists there we all kind of come full circle don't we <laughs> well i'm so glad you asked that question because that's great knowledge to know Okay, so the question was, so everyone, everyone heard what? Okay, so the question that Barbara Colvin asked was, did, did I have any information about Ida B. Wells going to England? And she wasn't aware of why she went to England. So I said, well, let me see if I can find something out real quick. And that's when I read um, Ida B. Wells traveled to Britain in 1893 in 1894 at the invitation of social activist, Catherine Impey, I-M-P-E-Y. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Her second tour was far more successful than the first as she exploited as many connections 
to Victorian print cultures as she could to maximize her message. So, and then what Ms. Colvin said is that it's kind of interesting because the suffragettes went to England first to get information to bring back to the States. And now here, one of our suffragettes was invited to go to England a couple tours about the women's rights to vote. where only the men were allowed to see. And the women had to be like in the balcony behind a curtain. And it, it made her so angry that she then began her whole women's movement saying that women need to get the right to vote. Yes, uh, that was an international anti-slavery. Yeah, that's, that's right. It was an anti-slavery convention that uh, drew people from around the world to England. And, uh, and when they put these women behind the curtains and said, you can't speak and you can't, I guess you can't see either. <laughs> but. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. Just because we're women. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys hear? Right. So one of the ladies here said, we got to keep up the fight. We do not want it to happen again. That was from... Phyllis. <laughs> I'm going to get the names. <laughs> any other questions or anything? Oh, looks like someone in your research. Oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you guys where I got all this from. Yes, I got I got all my information from history, the age history library.com. Yes, and I forgot to read that slide. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Uh, and I can tell you some other websites. It wasn't so many books. I went to, um, in my profession, they always tell us, always watch where you get information off the internet. So, um, so I'm really keen on what I get information from because a lot of times in pharmacy, there's a lot of misinformation on meds and then we have to communicate it to the general population. So we're trained to look at the website before you open it because you may get wrong information. So my, my information came out of three sources. Let me go to my email. It was the history.com. And then also I was on, it was a website that said, let me get it. It was, let's see, where is it? History.com, women, hold on, here it is. So I went to um, women.ca.gov, women of color and the fight for women's suffrage. Also the history.com as well as, um, there's a suffragist memorial. They have a great video that I just watched. Um, and so, that was the websites that I use. And then I went further into their website to get the information. So in reference to books to recommend, I will have to probably get that to the league because there are some great books, especially the ones that some already wrote, some of the suffragettes wrote, they wrote some books, but we probably have to have the library help us find them because they're probably archived since they're from the 1800s, 1900s. So. I can, I can get a list for, it's like, I'll send a list to the league and then um, we can share it. Any other, I think that was the last, you have a question? Oh, she's talking about my nonprofit. <laughs> Oh, well, that's, I can talk about that at another time. It's just a nonprofit that um, they had a question on my um, introduction about Relly's Purple Bag. So Relly's Purple Bag um, 
is a nonprofit that I created when I was 50 with the state of Ohio. And instead of, cause I've worked with like 15 to 30 years at the time with people with disabilities. Um, my oldest daughter, she's an adult with a disability. And um, when we was in the TPS district, I was asked to be like a parent advocate to help people with disabilities. And at the time I had to say no because I didn't know what I was doing, I was learning. And so now I try to be uh, a resource to whoever for disabilities, um, office, um, people aging populate, aging, A-G-I-N-G population, anybody who needs help. I just wanna be a resource to for whatever the needs are in our community. So that's what I do on my side job. <laughs> and um, so that's that was the question, what is Relly's Purple Bag? And that's what it is. So I, I haven't really promoted it like I would like to in Toledo because um, I don't want to do any conflict. I was also on the council, as you read, with the state. And so I chose not to move that forward because I was working with government to help with policy and fundraising to get to um, allocate funds to different counties of Ohio to make sure people with disabilities would get the right resources. So I just thought it would be a conflict and so that's what Riley's Purple Bag is. <laughs> Another question? Oh. Yes. Oh, most definitely. So one of the league ladies um, offer her services for the nonprofit. So I would contact her a little later. <laughs> now, we're networking all the way. So anyone on this Zoom also, if you have any ideas, the league is definitely interested in networking. So we can collaborate on any issue as long as it's part of their mission. <laughs> we're, we're interested in, in more members. So <laughs> and we have our membership program sign up sheet right here <laughs> all right no problem i'm going to turn it over back over to the league if she has the last words you want to exit it okay i guess they said we are all done and we're zoomed complete <laughs> and i want to thank everyone who um, came on um i didn't know who was going to be on the Zoom or who was going to be in the room. And I appreciate everyone and I appreciate the league giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.